Paul Hostovsky. Paul grew up in New Jersey, where he loved to play sports, climb trees, and write poetry. He started writing in fifth grade and said that his father uh, was a source of inspiration, being a novelist, and he uh, likes to look at it as his father was more is of a writer, marathon running style, and he more of a sprinter and likes poetry, prefers the poetry route. He studied at Bard in Northeastern and spent 10 years of summer workshops at the Fine Art Work Center in Provincetown. When not writing poems, he works as a staff interpreter at the State Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Boston. He interprets everything from medical appointments, board meetings, duck tours to AA meetings, but says he doesn't do lawyers. <laughs> He's the author of four books of poetry we have here today. He's a recipient of the Pushcart Prize, the Comstock Review's Muriel Craft Bailey Award, chosen by Mary Oliver, four Chappuck Awards, and he's featured on Poetry Daily and Writer's Almanac. And when I asked for one of the best moments in sharing a poem, Paul said when Garrison Keillor read one of his poems on NPR last February about a childhood friend named Michael Zucker, someone he had lost touch with. But Zucker happened to be listening in his car when it was being read on the radio. <laughs> He heard Paul's name, he heard the poem, and then he heard his name come into it, and said that he just about drove through the guardrail. <laughs> he was so surprised, and later sent an email telling Paul about it. Uh, I think that uh, Michael was uh, taken aback ba by Paul's poetry, and now I invite all of us to sit back and enjoy what Paul has to share. Please give a round of warm morning applause to Paul Hostovsky. violence of the violins. It was in them, they would say. It was what they were, what they did. It was part of them, carved into them like an F-hole, like a cleft tattooed onto a biceps. And there was nothing you could say or do to change that. It was their way. It was the way of the world, and also of the sun exploding a million miles away, warming your soft cheek. Face the music, they would say. Stop listening with your eyes closed. See the string tightened almost to breaking, the bow torturing it into song. Feel the skin stretched over the drum so tightly it makes your heart pound. And where did you think it all came from? The easy melody, the high tinkling finery. We are hurt into beauty. And you, up in the balcony, rising to your feet, applauding fiercely, look down at what your own hands are doing. This is called Concentration Camps. The way I explained it to myself, the way I made sense of it in my own way, I was eight when I first learned about them, was all those people starving and crying and dying together in those big piles behind the barbed wire were forced to concentrate on suffering. So it made sense to call it that. That part made sense, I thought, because concentration was very difficult, and I hated having to do it myself in elementary school when the teacher caught us looking out the window at the trees or the sky or the rooftops of the houses across the street, when she caught us looking out at life and forced us cruelly back to the problem under our noses, the problem of the numbers, the problem that wasn't going away no matter how much we looked away from it. And those people, I thought, they must have tried looking away from it too. They must have groaned and looked away. And there must have been sky above them. 
and trees on the other side, and maybe even a red rooftop or two off in the distance where life was going on in rooms with clean white linen and tinkling forks and knives. The way you make sense of a problem like that, a solution like that, a number like that, a number that's so big you can't fit it in your head, can't fit it in the world, though the world keeps trying that solution over and over, is to break it down, like the teacher said, and keep breaking it down until you get to the smallest parts, the ones divisible only by themselves and one, sky, tree, house, one little boy. Then look out the window at the world again, and see if it looks any different. This one's called Salamanders. We can't believe it's the first time I'm seeing one in 53 years on the planet, Josh, who is 10, and a collector, a connoisseur of salamanders, and me, his late middle-aged stepdad, they live on every continent except Antarctica, he says, holding it up to my nose for a better first look at this two-inch worm with a head and arms and legs and, incredibly, fingers and toes that he found under a rock this morning. And I think I have been living under a rock myself, the wrong rock, because I've never seen one of these little miracles with digits before. Or maybe I did, and I just don't remember because there was no one around like Josh holding it up to my nose in the shared cup of his own amazement. I think we learn to love this world from those who loved the world before us. But sometimes, especially lately, there are especially lately, those are the ones who have come after us, reaching up to touch our shoulder, saying, look at this miraculous living thing I am holding in my hands, and you are holding in your hands, too. This one's called The Names. I want to say something about the names. Ahmed, Fouad, Tarek, Tofik that are in the news these days, Yusuf, Anwar, Umar, Ishmael, and the way the newscasters have had to practice pronouncing them, Abdul, Amar, Abu, Muqtada al-Sadr. Don't you just love saying Muqtada al-Sadr? If you lined up all the names and just said them, one after the other, it would sound like you were fluent in Arabic. You could pull one over on your friends down at the pub, lubricate your tongue with a few beers, then turn to Jeff or Bill or Steve and say, Muqtada al-Sadr Ahmed Fouad Abdul Abu Umar Muhammad. <laughs> and just wait for a reaction. <laughs> Chances are a painful silence would swallow the pub whole because everyone would think you had been praying or reciting a poem or a fatwa when in fact all you were doing was saying the names, just lining them up and one by one firing off those frighteningly beautiful names. Uh, this one is called Coconut. Bear with me, I want to tell you something about happiness. It's hard to get at, but the thing is, I wasn't looking. I was looking somewhere else when my son found it in the fruit section and came running, holding it out in his small hands, asking me what it was and could we keep it? It only cost 99 cents, hairy and brown and hard as a rock and something swishing around inside. And what on earth, and where on earth, and this was happiness, this little ball of interest beating inside his chest, this interestedness beaming out from his face, pleading happiness. 
And because I wasn't happy, I said, to put it back. Because I didn't want it. Because we didn't need it. And because he was happy, he started to cry. Right? <laughs> right there in aisle five. So when we got it home, we put it in the middle of the kitchen table and sat on either side of it and began to consider how to get inside of it. <laughs> Wincing at the beautiful. So my friend Phil is telling me how he can't get a date, how he loves women, and how they're always giving him looks. So I ask him what kind of looks. So he winces at the beautiful, braless young woman passing by at that particular propitious moment, giving her a look of such longing and longevity that she returns his look with a look that kills his entire family tree. <laughs> from the roots, from the roots to the unimagined blossoms of the great grandchildren shriveling on his shriveling bow. And I think I have diagnosed his problem now. <laughs> And I think of quoting some lines from Rilke, but on second thought, I think a sports metaphor might serve him better. <laughs> so I steer the conversation round to basketball and the three-second rule, which says you can only stand inside the key for three seconds before they blow the whistle. They're just blowing the whistle on you, Phil, for breaking the three-second rule. <laughs> for standing there with your eyes popping out like basketballs. It's a game like any other, I tell him. Then I ask him if he wants to score. And now that I have his attention, now that I have his attention, I throw in those lines from Rilke. I tell him that beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror we're still just able to bear. And the reason we adore it so is that it serenely disdains to destroy us. And he winces again, and this time it's at the beauty of those lines or maybe their truth, which hits him like a three-pointer now that Rilke hits all the way from Germany at a distance of a hundred years. <laughs> this one's called A Woman Taking Off Her Shirt. <laughs> now, some poets like to do a lot of research for their poetry. <laughs> and, um, I guess this is one poem that I've done a lot of research on in order to write it. A woman taking off her shirt does so with arms crossed over her belly like she's hugging herself, and each hand takes hold above the opposite hip, and off it comes in a fluid motion like a fountain shooting up and falling down in a great arc, the shirt rising up and the breasts rising and falling and the hair falling, and finally the hands falling to her sides with the shirt in one hand inside out, while the man taking off his shirt, wrestles it off, grabs his own collar first, like he's going to beat himself up, <laughs> then dips his chin down like a fighter into the dark well of the shirt and climbs down in it, reaching back and grabbing a hold and pulling it up over himself and pulling himself down through it and out. <laughs> um, this poem is called Sick Well, Sick Well. He was good at being sick. After all, he'd been sick for a very long time. It wasn't a saleable skill at first, but when more and more people began to get sick, he realized he knew something they didn't. 
When you're sick, be sick. That is how to be sick well. How to be sick well would eventually become the title of his first book, which was a bestseller. People who got sick read it and learned how. And it was a revolutionary book because throughout history, people who got sick tried to get well and often died trying. But no one had ever thought of trying to be sick well. That was truly something new. And dying well would have been the title of his second book, but he died well before it could. Um, this one is called Why It Hurts So Much. Why It Hurts So Much. Because the pain was already in the body, the way the figure was already in the wood before the knife revealed it. The body like a pile of splinters growing around the glinting pain. The pain asserting itself like a birth, the body crumbling, falling away like a death. The pain was in the body long before the body was in pain. Long before the body was a body, the pain was there, and in the body before that body. The figure in the wood was in the tree, and in the tree before that tree. The pain is very old, much older than the body, which is why it hurts so much and why the body cannot hold it. Uh, this one's called OK. I'm an English major, OK? So when you say OK, and that's all you say, in reply to my much longer email about you and me and what happened and what happens and what will happen, I don't know how to read your OK, OK? <laughs> I mean, I'm scanning the Y and the A for some kind of meaning lurking in the choice to spell OK, OK, instead of OK or OK or OK or OK, as though you might, yeah, that's the visual part. You have to see that. <laughs> As though you might be spelling something out for me here. And then there's that exclamation point which follows your OK and probably doesn't warrant the kind of assiduous exegesis I've already <laughs> performed on it in my head, analyzing it for voice and tone and register and volume and pitch and number because, 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 because of the wonderful things we've done together in all kinds of weather and places and, p and positions and durations and voices and volumes. And although I know that isn't the point of your exclamation point, it's all I have to work with here outside of your okay. And everything your okay isn't saying which is what it's leaving out, which I know from having read one or two hundred thousand poems in my lifetime is just as important as what's left in. But what I want to know is, okay, where does that leave us? That was, <laughs> I, uh, I, think I was reading a lot of Mark Halliday at the time when I wrote that poem. I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Halliday's work, but the voice, that it reminds me of him. This is called The Place of Literature. The Place of Literature. Mr. Gordon was perhaps a little tipsy at the awards ceremony, perhaps a little scornful of the football coaches' ode to yardage, the basketball coaches' peons to the MVPs, the music teachers touting her flautist, the science teacher his scion of Einstein. So when Mr. Gordon got up to give the literary magazine award to me, he lurched a 
little drunkenly, swayed a little imperceptibly, steeply rocking in his moment on stage. Not to be outdone, he said, in his opinion, I was probably the greatest poet writing in English anywhere today. <laughs> and a gasp went up from the high school auditorium. <laughs> then murmurs of admiration and disbelief and mutiny spread <laughs> through the audience as I rose to accept Mr. Gordon's slightly exaggerated <laughs> handshake. Then he kissed me on the mouth and raised my hand above my head in the manner of referees and prize fighters, grinning glaringly over at the football coach and, and nodding trochaically. Trochaically. This is, this is the trochaic nod, folks. You saw it first here. This one is called Direction. No one gets lost anymore. If they don't have GPS, they have a MapQuest printout, thick blue line indelibly marking the way. Lacking those, there is the inevitable cell phone link to someone with a better sense of direction. No one gets lost anymore. They may not know who they are, but by God, they know where they are. <laughs> Even if it's nowhere in particular, they can tell you how, exactly how far it is from here. Even if they've no idea what they'll do there, they can tell you to the minute how long it will take to arrive. No one gets lost anymore. Travel is as predictable as California weather and is unrelated to life's vicissitudes. We all get lost lose our way in love, career, or spiritual seeking. There is no GPS to calmly, calmly guide us down the side roads of the human heart. No map quest for career paths, no guru on speed dial to direct us through the dark night of the soul. We need to practice getting lost again, learn to meander and cope with uncertainty, to trust dead reckoning to get us from here to there from where we are to where we really want to be. Yeah. Thank you. And then this one is, uh, it was inspired by a, uh, a quote from Gustave Flaubert, which I have at the beginning, and the poem is called Bourgeois. And the quote is, in order to write like a revolutionary, you need to live like a bourgeois. I do pretty well at the bourgeois part, <laughs> flossing my teeth daily, going to sleep at a reasonable hour, eating my vegetables. But so far, it's not bearing fruit. None of my poems is riddled with bullet holes. None has burst into flame when I read it, leaving behind an acrid cloud of smoke. No one will accuse me of going too far, of stepping over the line, of trying to reinvent the form. Despite my playing tennis without a net, Robert Frost would be comfortable with my words and images, while language poets would turn up their collective nose at my comprehensibility. I won't be lobbing my poems through suburban picture windows or launching them like mortar shells over the walls of academia. I won't tape poems to my chest and run amok in a supermarket. I will continue to write what I know, the zen of housework, ping pong with my son, gazing at stars while walking home through the local cemetery. And if I'm fortunate, a poem will occasionally slip into an unsuspecting reader's heart, set off a tiny explosion. Thank you. Each autumn, as light begins leaving here, despair reaches for me. There's no sign of late afternoon sunlight breaking through the almost bare branches. It's bad enough that on new moon nights, 
our pond is dark, not even a shimmer of reflection, of reflected light makes its way across nighttime water to shore. In my witch woman's mind, I begin to believe my own words, not those news stories defining psychopaths as being always loners. I begin to contemplate dinner time inside a candy-roofed cottage. Yes, I light my oven, sit with pen and paper, and then hope that I'll discover my words accepted by an impressive writer's journal. I know there are no more yesterdays, no bony fingers to fatten in this time of waning daylight, but I still search for words, for, for, for ways to fatten my words. What I've kept at bay is free to wreak havoc on my thoughts, and I tell more about what wildness means to me. I've seen chipmunks and squirrels year after year forage for mulberries from our trees. Blossoms opening is true labor as light returns. Thank you.